it's two things really and it's things that some people might disagree with but I need to tell a little story first. Welcome back to the point and click devlog, an ongoing series in which if Jazz is wearing this shirt you know he's going to get thrown out of the house. So there's this new YouTube original show about Will Smith and it's a bit weird. On paper, it's about him trying to get into the best shape of his life. In fact, the show is called The Best Shape of My Life. And it opens with him revealing that he's unhappy with how his body looks after putting on weight for his latest film. Although to be fair, Will Smith's idea of being out of shape is I think a little bit different to mine. Anyway, you watch along while he works out and does some crazy stunts and then for absolutely no reason, save for the fact that presumably the Dubai tourist board gave him a boatload of cash, Will goes to Dubai for a bit. So it's a weird show, but what's most weird about it is that it's not about Will losing weight at all, or about Dubai. Like sure, he does lose weight and he does go to Dubai, but the whole show is actually a very thinly guised way to market his new autobiography. See, in every episode, Will, his family and friends sit down and he reads out chapters of his book, each of which then thematically links back to what's going on in that episode. And by the end of the limited series, the weight loss stuff has almost completely taken a backseat to that book selling. And it works. Like, I got the book. I mean, in my defence, I had a bunch of audible tokens to burn, but moreover, you know, I grew up with Will Smith. Like, Boom Shake the Room was one of the first singles I ever owned, believe it or not. The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air was a tea time staple at my house. And when his movies were big, he was like the biggest movie star in the world. Welcome to Earth. Sure, his career is a bit weird now compared to back then, but if you're on the hunt for, you know, a good audiobook to listen to in the gym or while you do chores or whatever, it's legitimately great. So, right, what does any of that have to do with game development? Uh, just very quickly, I should probably say here that if you want to support this channel, you can become a patron on Patreon, and for your troubles, you'll get access to uh, an exclusive bi-weekly Let's Play series in which I look at point-and-click games, old and new, from like a game design perspective to try and figure out what works, what doesn't, and what we can steal. It's uh, three pounds a month and that really helps me buy things like beer and cheese. So, thanks. Like, this video is called What Will Smith Taught Me About Game Development? So, what does he have to say on the matter in the book? Well, nothing specifically. In fact, this video's inspiration can be more accurately attributed to Quincy Jones, but that inspiration is derived from a story in Will's autobiography that really stuck in my mind. Let me explain. So very briefly, in the early 90s, Will and DJ Jazzy Jeff had released a few albums, but success had gone to their heads, their latest release was a flop, and they both went pretty much bankrupt when the IRS caught onto their apparent aversion to paying their taxes. Then through various who you know circumstances that I can't even remember now, Will gets invited to a party at Quincy Jones's house where luckily basically everyone from NBC that you would need to sign off on a new TV show is in attendance. A script gets thrust into Will's hand and Quincy demands that they clear out the furniture in the room and that Will should do a live audition there at the party in front of a room of like absolutely A-list celebrities. Anyway, long story short, Will clearly nails this terrifying audition and Quincy goes into overdrive. He gets all the NBC guys together, he finds a lawyer at the party and has a contract drawn up to greenlight the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air then and there. The show then goes from that party to airing on TV in like record time and becomes obviously an absolute smash hit in the process. And throughout the whole thing, Quincy is apparently saying the following phrase on repeat. No paralysis through analysis! No paralysis through analysis, or in other words, don't overthink your projects to the point of destruction. And the more I've thought about it, the more I think no paralysis through analysis should become the indie game dev mantra. 
With every aspect of game development, from creating art to designing core gameplay mechanics and from building out puzzles to developing your narrative, I feel like there's always the urge to question yourself and your decisions way too much. There's that saying that perfect is the enemy of good and the more you look at anything, the further anything you've done will seem from perfect, so I think it can be poisonous to do too much thinking. Now, that's not to say that you should just go on a full-on sprint towards the finish line without putting any thought into anything, but rather that I think it's important to know where to draw a line. If you've scoped out uh, an outline for a game that you think at first pass sounds amazing, then you know what, it's probably good enough to get going with. If you've drawn your game's main character, use that design and move forwards. Yes, things may change and maybe dramatically as you work things through, but you'll never evolve those ideas into something great unless you make a start in the first place. If you let your worries or overanalysis stop you from moving past any one stage of the process, you'll never make a game. It's as simple as that. Something is better than nothing, in other words. And this thinking has been especially relevant for me lately as I hit a bit of paralysis or a bit of a stall since making it a third of the way through my game's development. The decision to either push on or stop and polish what I'd made has made me do neither in effect. And it's only really been recently, after having listened to this book, that I've realised I really need to just crack on and not let, you know, over-analysis get in the way of my progress. So yeah, no paralysis through analysis. You never know which of your projects is going to be the next Fresh Prince after all. Of course, there is another lesson to be learned from this whole thing, and it's a kind of meta important one about marketing. As I said, I ended up buying Will's book because it was sneakily sold to me via a show about losing weight. Like, you can cynically look at that and say that it's a bit unethical or morally weird, or whatever, but it worked on me. And I've been thinking about that almost as much as I've been thinking about no paralysis through analysis. Obviously in today's market, getting people to know and care about your indie game is basically as difficult and as important as making the thing in the first place. Guerrilla marketing, or marketing that uses tactics that you don't see coming, is probably the only real way to stand out as we move forwards and as indie gaming grows. The journey that ended with me spending an Audible credit on Will Smith's book started with me watching a completely different standalone product, a TV show that sold itself as something completely unrelated. It's genius really, and I think there's really only one major lesson to take away from that. If simply making a game isn't good enough anymore, you've got to make something else that will help you get it in front of people. And I know there'll be people in the comments saying that you should first and foremost make a game for yourself, right? And people buying or playing it should be considered a bonus rather than the main goal. And that's absolutely right. But you know, I think you can do both. <laughs> I think you should be able to make a very personal passion project and have people want to play it and pay for the privilege as well. Like. My game is a personal endeavour, but I want to sell some copies of it too, mainly so I can keep on making them. And to do that, you've got to get people interested. Now, you may be asking what makes me, as someone who hasn't even finished making one game yet, like any kind of expert on this subject, but, well, look at where you are. It's always nice when I get comments from people on these videos thanking me for sharing my progress and learnings and stuff, and that is really rewarding, but like, to be totally transparent and, I don't know, maybe upset some people? Guys, this channel functions primarily as marketing for my upcoming game. If my game is similar to Will's autobiography, this channel is me dicking about in Dubai. Like, sure, I might not sell many copies of my game in the end, but by the time it's released, I will have as many opportunities to tell people that it's available as I have YouTube subscribers. And right now, that's like, what, two and a half thousand times better than nothing. So I guess what I'm saying is, if you're making a game that you ultimately do want people to play, I would advise putting your thinking cap on now about how you can get them invested in you and in that game long before it's finished and ideally in a way that catches people off guard. Give streaming a go, make a devlog, 
try TikTok dances, write a game dev cookbook, I don't know. Just remember that doing something like that is much, much better than doing nothing. And if you're now sat there worrying about exactly the right way to go about that, then there's only really one thing to say to that. No paralysis through analysis. So look, thanks very much for watching, liking, subscribing, and being a nice person. Remember, you're more than welcome to join the other devs in our community Discord server for help and support on everything from marketing to pixel art and everything in between. Hopefully I'll see you there. If not, no worries. Maybe I'll see you in the next one. Bye.